A reading from the first book of Samuel. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Nina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, for her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been practicing out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grants the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now read Samuel 2, 1 through 10 in unison. Hannah prayed and said, My heart is exalted to the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derives my enemies, because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly, but not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is God of knowledge, and by the action shall celebrate. What houses of my life are broken? But the feeble heard on the string. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has born seven, but the sheep who has been children is the Lord. The Lord kills to bring his life, he brings down to show, and he raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low to the officer's cause. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and embarrass the seat of honor. The builders of the earth are rulers, and on them the gifts of the world. He will guard the feet of the sexual ones, but the witches shall be cut off from the garments. For not by might does one prevail. The Lord is as shall be shattered, and the most high will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king, and exalt the power of his anointing. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. 
But when Christ has offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since then has been reigning, until his enemies will be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies for us who after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confided confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great feast over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience on our bodies, washed with purest water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thirty-five feet long, 
by 18 feet wide and 12 feet high. Think about that. <laughs> Construction on the expansion of the Second Jerusalem Temple began in 20 BCE, and it wasn't completed until about 80 years later in 63 CE, just seven years before its destruction by the Romans. And so it was still under construction in Jesus' day. And they, like us, were pretty impressed with the displays of power and might. These opening verses are the outset of Mark 13, a chapter sometimes called the Markan Apocalypse. It's Jesus' final teaching to his disciples before the passion overtakes him, and in that sense is a kind of farewell discourse. Unfortunately, when I say the word apocalypse, many of you probably think of a Hollywood interpretation created by Francis Ford Coppola in Apocalypse Now, or some other doomsday version like The Day After Tomorrow. Don't ever watch that when you're pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> but the word apocalypse means a revealing or an unveiling. It's a form of literature very prevalent in Jesus' day and had been for some time. We're not used to reading this type of storytelling, and it sounds really weird to us. The closest genre we have to it now is probably science fiction, but that's not really that close. Apocalypses, like the book of Daniel or Revelation, are ways of telling stories of hope about events that are taking place at the time of the writing of hope. We don't see that really when we first read it. They are not predictions of the future, no matter how tempting it may be to read them and say, oh, see, it's the end of the world, just like Jesus said. It's easy to do that because history repeats itself. There are still wars. There is still famine and dictators claiming divine authority. Those that crave power will use these types of ominous stories to convince us to be afraid so we will follow them, the self-made saviors. Ancient people would have read or heard lots of apocalypse literature and would have understood how these apocalypses were functioning. They're functioning to provide hope because they're all about how there are wicked forces in the world and which are at work in the world, and the revelation that God has and will overcome. They are meant to encourage the reader to hold on, keep the faith. What seems to be the end of the world is but birth pains. It is the end of the beginning. And so the point of these books was for people to keep the faith when evil appeared all around them in times of war and oppression to be reminded that God is with them. But the glimpses of what is behind the veil of this world seem so strange. And even the writers had a hard time describing what they saw. That we can get so caught up in the strange imagery and the mystery of what we can't understand that we fail to see the hope. What apocalyptic literature does for us now is to remind us that when empire becomes a force that oppresses, that persecutes the stranger, that causes further harm to the marginalized, that it is unjust to the prisoner, that takes away care for its women and children, that makes the rich richer and makes the poor poorer, that God will turn the empire of institutions and governments upside down. And 30 years after Jesus was crucified by the empire, those massive stones were upended. Empires come and go, but God remains forever. And those that oppress God's beloved, 
which very clearly happens to be the poor, the outcast, the unfit, the helpless, the immigrant, the despised, those that oppress them and do not help them, but cause them further harm. God gets pretty darn angry about that. There is and there comes a day of judgment. The song of Hannah that we heard today and Jesus' words to his disciples while they were sitting on a hill overlooking that temple were about the hope that God gives. That when all seems lost, all seems hopeless, hang on. God is present with you in it. God is listening. The Spirit is at work in ways you cannot see nor understand but have faith. God is going to turn it upside down. The stones of institutions and empires and corrupt systems do and will come down. God frees the slaves that carry those stones. We end our year in the Gospel of Mark today getting ready for Advent in a couple of weeks. It's a purposeful arrangement in the Sunday lectionary cycle. Because it's hinting that the light is coming. It's a good time to remind ourselves what Mark's gospel is all about, the whole thing. In the midst of desolation and despair, Jesus announces the radiant good news of a new era of healing, liberation, and love. Having heard the song of Hannah this morning, it may sound familiar. Mary's Magnificat, which we will hear in a few weeks, is based on Hannah's joyful response to finally being heard after she had been dismissed, accused of being drunk, wouldn't sit down and be quiet, and wanted to be on equal footing with other women. Despite appearances then and now, Mary's Magnificat and Hannah's song have it right. God is at work turning the world upside down, or rather, right side up, serving all, restoring health, freeing captives, doing justice, and welcoming the stranger. Regardless if it is the Roman Empire or any oppressive government that came after, we are to be actively participating in the redemptive work of God in the world. That hasn't changed. Christians are not to be passive observers. Often when we get too comfortable and complacent, we forget those who are suffering or we just don't want to be bothered. So when times get tough for us, it snaps us back to the reality of the work we are supposed to have been doing as Christ followers every day. God gets our attention. We've been too comfortable and forgotten the urgency of those who are suffering until it touches us. We are to be the bearers of hope who have none to share a cup of cold water to the thirsty, to make sure everyone is fed. Visit the prisoner, to help those who need health care, to welcome the strangers in our midst and to soothe the suffering. We can't slack in our responsibilities. God is on the move, even and especially when all hope seems lost. To really hear what he's saying, we have to ask, what are we feeling hopeless about today? Where are the shadows of discouragement and despair for our neighbors and our communities? Once we're standing in those shadows, emotionally and intellectually, we can truly hear the good news Jesus is proclaiming and proclaim it ourselves. In a few minutes, we are going to baptize another new life into the body of Christ. 
One of the last actions of the liturgy is to light a candle that represents the newly baptized. Vivian's candle will get its light from the Paschal candle, the Christ candle. This candle represents the resurrection and that we are resurrection people. The light of Christ is handed to her and is now in her. And she will learn to carry that light out into the world. And that is true for all of us. When the world around you seems in disarray and war and fear abound at home and afar, to the underprivileged whose days are turned into despair without consolation, these times are not new. But there is a light that continues to shine from the Jewish teacher of Nazareth, a faith that was always intended by Jesus as a way of survival for the oppressed, not a religion for the powerful and dominant. Jesus came to save the lost, to set the captives free, to bind up the mighty. I think sometimes we lose sight of that. At our baptism, our own light was lit from this light of the Paschal candle. It reminds us that we are to carry that light back out into the world. We carry the light of Christ in us, and we need to let it be seen. In him was light, and the life was the light of humankind, the Gospel of John reminds us. Howard Thurman writes in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, that wherever Jesus' spirit appears, the oppressed gather fresh courage, for he announced the good news that fear, hypocrisy, and hatred, the three hounds of hell that track the trail of the disinherited, need have no dominion over them. That is what apocryphal literature revealed to those who heard it like the people in Israel held captive in Babylon or living under the oppressive government of the Roman Empire. Empires continue. Whether the stones of the empire get built back up or whether they are toppled again, we carry the light. The empire has no dominion over you. You carry the light of Christ who brings freedom. You carry the light in the storm, you carry the light in the calm. Our job is to walk into the shadows and shed light. Light shines on what tries to stay hidden and reveals the truth. Someone told me this week, sunshine is the best disinfectant. I've never heard that before, <laughs> but yes, Life cleanses the germs that grow in our society. I can see a connection between light and apocalypse. They both reveal and unveil. Both expose the evil at work in our world for what it is. Oh, look at these stones. Oh, look at these great buildings. My friends, don't get distracted by the overwhelming power and greed of this world. Stay steadfast and carry the light forward. Stand in front of those stones of the empire with your light, even if your knees shake. Do not grow weary in caring for the needs of all who are suffering in our communities. Just do it for one. For together, we can be a blazing light that chases back gloom. The shadows can never overwhelm the light. Take comfort in the words of Archbishop Oscar Romero of El Salvador. Christianity discerns that beyond the night, the dawn already glows. The hope that does not fail is carried in the heart. Amen. Amen.